So I've been making wildlife, natural history programs, for about 18 years now. And the ones that have kind of done best around the world are the ones that focus on so-called deadly animals. But the twist has always been for me that it's always about animals being deadly in their own world to other animals. So much so that we even put that at the front of every single program. After all, you know, if you're an aphid, then a ladybird is the most dangerous animal in the entire world. So it's not about animals being dangerous to us as human beings. And I kind of feel like over the years that I've gained a certain responsibility to show that image, to show that the animals that we may be the most frightened of are actually very, very rarely dangerous to us. And my experience shows over and over again that the perceptions we have of so-called deadly animals are just massively skewed. And that things like crocodiles and big cats and snakes and spiders and scorpions would in almost every single situation try and avoid a confrontation with human beings if they possibly can. And there is no group of animals that that is more true about than the sharks. So the sharks, to me, are the dream group of animals to work with because you perfectly play off that kind of uh, that line between perception of risk and actual danger. The second I get in the water with something like this, people kind of assume that I'm going to get eaten. But I know that actually I'm really comparatively safe. And actually, in actual fact, I would be much more at risk if I was diving alongside a big male territorial sea lion than I would be alongside a big shark. And this is not just my feeling, not just my experience. The statistics also bear this out. So these are a few sort of overview statistics of shark attacks around the world. To this side, you can see that shark attacks have been rising since 1950, but only really in line with what you'd expect with the fact that the world's population has tripled since then. And if you look to the other side, you can see a list of shark attacks over the last decade. And to me, the thing that really stands out is how few they are. I mean, if you look at them, 2007, one fatal shark attack around the world. Last year, which was supposed to be a bad year for shark attacks, four people around the world killed by sharks. In a planet of seven billion people, it is pretty much insignificant. Certainly when you consider that the World Health Organization says that uh, diseases that are spread by mosquitoes might kill as many as a million people around the world every single year. You are actually more likely to die falling out of bed or being crushed by a falling vending machine. You are hundreds, possibly thousands of times more likely to be killed by being struck by lightning. Jack Bauer of 24 has killed more people than sharks have since the beginning of recorded time. And for the last two years, there have been more people killed taking selfies than by sharks. And if this isn't evidence of evolution by natural selection, I don't know what is. So why then, if these animals do us so little damage, are they so omnipresent in our conscious? Are we so terrified of sharks? Because, you know, most of them kind of look like this, and there's certainly no danger to us, although they do have a, a rather devilish set of moustaches. Most sharks are of no danger to us, but really, I think the media is the thing that's, that's most to blame here. You know, ever since Jaws, we've been taught over and over again that sharks are malicious, man-eating monsters that are out to get us. And, you know, a, a hurricane or a typhoon that may kill tens of thousands of people may flit across our front pages in a day or so. But a surfer who punches a shark in the face in South Africa will be global news for weeks because it's a powerful story and it connects with how we view the media most effectively. You know, we connect with individual stories and we connect with grand dramas and things that appeal to our sense of, of I guess, primal fear. And I guess that's a very good reason why, whenever you read things about animals in the press, you should take it with a pinch of salt, because, you know, journalists, they kind of realise that wild animals don't sue, and so they can write pretty much whatever they want about animals, and it's going to be absolutely fine for them. This, though, is far more the image that I have as sharks, of an animal of incredible mystery and majesty. An animal, that, the smallest of which, the dwarf lantern shark, could fit in my pocket. The largest, the biggest fish on earth, the whale shark, would pretty much span this room and is completely harmless, a filter feeder. As is this, the epaulet shark. I mean, the majority of species of shark kind of look like this. The only danger they're really going to be to us is if you were to trip over one. And epaulet sharks, they have this remarkable, remarkable resourcefulness, the ability to walk across dry land using their, their pelvic and pectoral fins to move to, to bodies of water when, when it dries up around them.
Or this, the, uh, the tasseled wobbegong, which kind of looks a little bit like a shark that's been run over, and has this incredible cryptic camouflage, blends in so beautifully with its environment. And, and one stage further, one that looks like it's been actually run over by a steamroller, would be the manta ray, which you know, is part of the elasmobranchs, the same group of animals as the sharks, and obviously is no danger to us as human beings. Sharks have been around on the planet for a very, very long time, at least 400 million years. So around about 380 million years ago, Stethocanthus was in our seas. And it sort of looks a little bit like someone's glued a hairbrush to its back. But there is an intriguing possibility that this could be like a modern remora or suckerfish, a way of attaching itself to larger animals so it could get a free ride and possibly a free feed. And um, Wikipedia have very kindly shown us for scale here how large Stethocanthus is alongside one of the Charlie's Angels. Uh, obviously, this was not a huge shark, but if you fast forward to about 280 million years ago, then there were some giant sharks in our seas, things like this, Helicoprion, which looks a little bit like it's trying to gargle a buzzsaw. And that tooth whirl is very well represented in the fossil record. They can get to be larger than a, a, a dustbin lid and lead us to believe that Helicoprion could have got to be six meters, maybe even 10 meters in length. So fast forward now to about 95 million years ago, and you things, get things like Paratriarchus. And if you look at where the, uh, the fins and the tail are aligned on this shark, it's almost identical to a modern zebra or leopard shark. There is a, a misconception, I guess, that animals that have been around for a long time in, in pretty much their present form are throwbacks, they're, they're outdated, and that's just not true. Evolution by natural selection works by tiny random mutations being preserved over time in an organism because they confer some small advantage to that organism. It's a process that works fastest when the organism's under challenge from its environment. But when it fits perfectly into its niche, that process slows down. Sharks have, for want of a better word, been perfect in design for tens of millions of years. And yes, I realize that by using the word design in this talk, I am going straight to biologists' hell. So the sharks, one of the things that really shows you that these are incredibly highly evolved animals is their, their senses. What you're looking at here are the nares, or nostrils, of a shark. They're capable of smelling an odiferous substance that has been diluted as much as a million times. That's often described as being a single drop of water in an Olympic swimming pool-sized area of water. Sorry, a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool-sized area of water. Running down the length of the animal is the lateral line, which is a thin channel filled with very fine hairs called cilia. Those are so susceptible to movements in the water around it that these sharks can perceive the movements of fish that are long gone simply by the wake that they leave behind. But these are nothing alongside what kind of look like a bunch of highly squeezable blackheads in the snout of this shark. These are called the ampulla or ampullae of Lorenzini, which kind of sounds a little bit like treasure on a sunken Italian galleon, but they are highly susceptible to weak electrical fields and to electromagnetism. It's actually a, a pore that's filled with jelly, and at the base of that is a bundle of nerve endings, and they're so sensitive that they can pick up the weak electrical fields that are created by the beating heart of their prey, even if it's buried on the seabed. They can also use them for, for navigating using the world's magnetic field. And because they are so sensitive, sharks are really intrigued by our cameras and our microphones underwater, and over and again they'll swim up and they'll stick their snout right into the lens of your camera. Sometimes, a little bit too close for comfort. And it kind of seems that the ampulla of Lorenzini are almost like a shark erogenous zone. So this blue shark here, which I'm hoping is going to pop up in a second, is um, this blue shark here is not actually trying to bite me. It is, in fact, getting me to stroke it. So over and over again, this blue shark was swimming around in the water and putting its snout up into my hand, almost going, go on, just, just rub. And if you just rub on their snout for a little while, you can see them kind of going, oh, that's so nice. That's just great. And eventually, they just go to sleep. And this is, is very well known in sharks. It's called tonic immobility. And biologists have learned that simply by stroking the snout of a shark or by bending its fins or by flipping it over onto its back, a shark will go completely catatonic. It will lie in this state for as much as 15 minutes, and it's, it's a fantastic way for biologists to be able to study sharks, to take samples, to measure them, to even, even sample what's in their stomachs without the animal exhibiting any stress whatsoever, and then just gets up, swims on, and carries on with its day.
This is something that we did in the Bahamas with, with many different kinds of sharks, including lemon shark pups. And uh, they're kind of cute. I mean, when you're working with these animals, it, it is the absolute antithesis of, I think, what people expect to see from sharks. And I guess it's probably quite easy to convince you that a, a lemon shark pup is harmless. A little bit harder when you're talking about a great white, which is obviously the most iconic animal on the planet. And, and this is an animal that's bristling with teeth and has this air of menace about it. But believe it or not, you can, in ideal circumstances, swim alongside a great white shark. Now, clearly, I'm not suggesting that they are harmless to us as human beings. That would be ridiculous. And I, there is no way that I would ever consider swimming alongside a Cape fur seal colony in, in murky water at dawn or dusk off the coast of South Africa. But here in Guadalupe, off the coast of Mexico, where the water is crystal clear, and the sharks can see you, you can swim alongside them. To begin with, what you do is you go down from the safety of a shark diving cage, and you look out into the water, and what you're doing is you're trying to assess the individual characteristics, the personalities of individual sharks. If it sounds a bit nuts to be trying to figure out what's going on inside a fish's head, you can do it. And to a certain extent, they give away their intentions from how they hold themselves in the water. So if you have a shark that has its pectoral fins drop down below it into this position, its back arched, its mouth open, its gills billowing, and its movements are kind of angular or erratic, then that one is primed for predatory action and you stay inside the cage. But if all of those things are reversed, then we're learning now, after hundreds of hours underwater with these animals, you can swim out alongside them. And in clear water, where there is no chance of them misidentifying you, of them thinking that you're something else, they'll just swim around you. They will completely ignore you. They could not be less interested in you. Their senses are so well developed, they know what's food in the water, they know it's not you, and they will actively avoid you. And it's not just great whites we've done this with. We've done this with every single species of shark that is considered to be dangerous to human beings, with, with bull sharks, tiger sharks, great hammerheads, makos, blues. And we've also discovered the same thing with all of those species too. However, in the same one year that we human beings lose fewer than 10 people around the world to sharks, we humans are taking as many as 100 million sharks from the world's oceans. Potentially 73 million of those will merely have their fins removed, and then the body of the shark will be dropped back into the water and wasted. And it has to be one of the most profligate, most, most wasteful forms of hunting and fishing on Earth. It's kind of the equivalent of killing a cow purely to put its tail into a soup. And that is what's happening with sharks. So the, the fins are brought back to harbour, they're dried, they're sent around the world, and they're used primarily as an ingredient in a soup which is served at weddings and at festivals. And this is, is most common in places like Indonesia, Taiwan, the Philippines, China. Um, and it is something which is causing a critical, critical overfishing of sharks. It is entirely possible that we could lose sharks from our world's oceans inside our lifetimes, and that to me seems something that we really have to do something about, because to completely lose an apex predator from an environment, we have no idea what the knock-on effects will be, but chances are it's going to be bad. This here is the oceanic white tip shark. It's a close cousin of the great white. It was once called the lesser white shark, and this animal would once have been the most widespread and the most numerous large predator on the planet. But in recent years, as much as 98% of its numbers have completely disappeared. This is a shark that we could easily lose within the next decade. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there's lots of potential ways we can address it. First and foremost, I, I think getting involved with some of the NGOs and the charities that are, that are seeking to bring in legislation. So for example, the Shark Trust have a wonderful campaign called No Limits, No Future, which is, is trying to impose quotas on how many sharks that are caught. I mean, after all, you know, there are limits on how much cod or halibut or, or, or tuna we catch. There should be limits on how many sharks we take from the world's oceans as well. And they're trying to bring in legislation so that people, fishermen, can only bring in sharks to harbour if their fins are still attached to the bodies. It makes a massive, massive difference to the economics and to whether fishermen actually actively target sharks if they're allowed to bring just back the fins or if they have to bring back the entire animal. We can engage with charities like Bite Back, who are doing their best to try and have shark fin soup 
banned. And here in this country, that's something we, I think, definitely can achieve. I mean, there are, there are probably only 30 restaurants left now in the UK, and I'm pretty sure that we can do a job of trying to get the, uh, the shark fin soup banned. And also, import allowances. So you can bring a litre of tequila into the UK, 20 kilos of shark fin. It just doesn't make any sense. It's something we definitely have to address. But um, there was a guy on here just a little while ago who was talking about influencers, who was talking about the people that have the biggest, I guess, influence on how we live our lives. And what I've done is I've compiled a list of the top 100 people in the countries that consume the most shark fin soup. And I'm putting this list up on my, my Facebook site and on my website as well. And my idea is that something that we could do from our living rooms, from our lounges, would be to get in touch with these people, to try and connect with them and see if they will send out a message to their followers. Their followers encompass at least a half of the population of the world. If we could, for example, tweet this talk or tweet some other messages about sharks and addressing the balance and rebranding these animals, then potentially we could make a massive difference. If we could change people's attitudes, then potentially we could change behavior, and we could stem the demand in this trade which is not sustainable, which cannot continue on into the future. And the last image that I'd like to leave you with is this one. I'd like you to look at this image and see not a potential man-eater, not a, a terrifying, malicious, man-eating monster, but instead a pregnant mother See a female that will have to get to be older than we do as human beings before it reaches sexual maturity. A female who will carry that youngster for longer than a human mother would carry, who might travel thousands of miles to get to safe seas to give birth to its young. An animal that is listed as at least vulnerable in some parts of its range as critically endangered, that is less danger to us as human beings than a honeybee, than a Labrador, than a Phrygian cow, or than a prawn. I want you to see this as an animal that's been around on our planet, or its, its kind have been around on our planet for hundreds of millions of years, and yet could disappear in our lifetimes unless we do something about it. Thank you all so, so much for listening.